Hi there, Greg Donovitz here, and welcome to episode five of Rock Talk. First of all, I want to thank everybody for your kind messages and letters and suggestions that we've been getting in. And I want to thank uh, Lawrence Gowan for the two episodes we did with him, and of course, starting it all off with the great Eddie Kramer. Now, you might notice that behind me, the basement here looks a little bit different than normal. Still a lot of Beatles stuff, but I'm not sitting in my basement. I'm actually in B4 Studios with uh, our production engineer, producer, Reese Burnell, who's sitting right over there. Yes. And uh, what he does, besides getting the sound and everything put together, this is actually a green screen behind me. So it's just a green wall, but then we can project anything we want onto it. And uh, some of the animation bits that Reese has been doing, like you recall in the second Gowan interview, we had we had uh, M Mickey Rooney's head bobbing, uh, first episode, Mickey Rooney's head bopping across the screen, which is probably happening right now. That's what Reese does. So thank you, Reese Brunel. One of these days, you'll actually get paid. I met this guy that's coming on the show right now in uh, Grand Laguna Beach Resort in Dominican Republic in Sasua. And my friend Tim that owns the resort said to me, we got a guy saying here that you should meet. He's a bass player for Prince's new power generation band. And I went, get the hell out of here. But it turned out to be true. And Josh and I went around and we went to restaurants and we hung out and stuff. And we've become friends. And without further ado, a guy that got to spend five, count them, five years on the road with Prince and the New Power Generation, all the way from Houston, Texas, my friend, Josh Dunham. And there, by the magic of the internet, there's my friend Josh. How you doing, man? Good. How you doing? Great. Okay, good. Now, you're in Houston, right? Yes, I'm in Houston. Uh, born and, and raised there in Houston? Born, born and raised. I grew up in church, playing Baptist church. My dad was a pastor, you know. Uh, started on drums and I moved to the bass guitar and I fell in love with it ever since. Man. Well, that, that's funny because that was the, the first question I've got written down there, which I'm not going to show you right there. Okay. <laughs> before we get to your time with Prince, uh, I'm interested in, I, I read about the church riff and, and then I didn't know that you played drums, but what was the music scene like when you were coming up in, in Houston? What was going on? Who were you listening to? Who were I your mean, influences? Uh, I mean, at that time, um, I listen to a lot of gospel, a lot of quartet, you know, uh, uh, what's uh, like the Canton Spirituals, uh, Mighty Clouds of Joy, even like Mass Choir, James Cleveland, you know, the Hawkins family. Um, yeah, so those type of, you know, uh, artists. So it was mostly just church driven stuff that I would listen to uh, coming up. Was this Baptist church? A Baptist church, yes. You know, it's funny, man, when I travel and in the DR or Jamaica, wherever I've been, I always seem on Sunday morning to wind up in a local church and just sit there and they're very welcoming. You know, it's like, OK, you're not from around here, uh, but yeah. come on in. And the music is always phenomenal. They always yeah. got somebody with a guitar, you know, or a drummer and they're, everybody's singing. And that's cool. So how many years did you do that for? Oh, uh, man. I mean, I grew up in church. Shoot. Uh, a while. I mean, I still play at church now. So I, 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 every, I guess the day I started playing, I just never stopped. You know, even when I would go out on the road, I would come back. I always come home and play somewhere at church. You know, uh, I mean, well, I'm 42 now, so <laughs> it's it's been a long time. You know, uh, yeah. who were your favorite bass players back in the day? Um, okay, when I was coming up, I started listening to uh, Jocko. I like Jocko. Um, and then I heard about Marcus Miller and then there's a local cat here named Barry Jackson, um, uh, great bass player. I listened to him a lot. He played on a couple of records that I used to listen to. Um, uh, who else? Um, just a lot of different, different guys, uh, Victor Wooten, um, Did you listen to James uh, Jameson? Guy. Uh, I listened to a little bit of James Jameson. Uh, Larry Graham was another one that I love to listen to. You know, I just found, I heard about this, that you had a connection. I was hoping you were going to bring Larry up. I mean, he invented the pop and the slap, didn't he? Oh, yes. <laughs> I saw him play a couple of times with Sly and a Family Stone Man, and I mean, he was just awesome as a oh, I bet. <laughs> yeah. And of course, seeing Sly. But, you know, you end up with, now you didn't go directly from the church group into Prince's band. So did you play in R&B bands or any rock bands in the in that interim? Oh, well, I did. Well, once I moved to, uh, went to California, 
I had the opportunity to play with Frank McCone. I don't know if you heard of Frank McCone. Yes, um, he is. Yeah, work with Frank. And then uh, while I was in L.A., I had a chance to work with Patty LaBelle. So I started, you know, kind of kind of meeting people, networking, and where it started to get around. And by that time, you know, the Prince gig came about. Well, your girlfriend at the time, who eventually became your wife, uh, Cora. Yeah. He was a drummer that was playing with Frank McComb. Right. And then Prince showed up one night. And was, now, she was your girlfriend at the time when Prince showed up? She's my the, girlfriend at the time, yeah. A place in L.A., and she's a hell of a drummer, too, man. We've been yeah. watching her. She, <laughs> she, she hits those things. So she calls you up and says, hey, you're not going to believe this. Prince just showed up at the club. And then you come down, and, and some riff went down where he bought her a set of drums. Yeah. Okay, do you want to take yeah, it over so, from there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she's in the club, and she's texting me the whole time. Like, Prince is talking to me, like, you know. <laughs> He's, we talking about artists and he offered to buy me a drum set. So uh, after they spoke, you know, um, he left and she made her order for her drum set. Um, Frank, he, he would normally do shows in Japan every year around the holidays. And that particular year, the bass player, uh, he wanted to stay home with his family. And so she told Frank about me and I came out to LA to rehearse with them before going to Japan. While we were there, the drum set was complete. And so uh, she reached out to Prince's assistant and said, hey, tell Prince, thank you, I got my drum set. You know, it looks great, it sounds great. So Prince sends word back and says, well, come to the house, bring the drum set, let's jam. So we all go over to Prince's house. I'm there too, cause I'm in town, you know. Uh, we jam a little bit, we talk about music, you know, and Prince, you know, talks to Frank about, you know, what, what what's his vision, you know, for his career and, and um, and he just told Frank, you know, when you come back from Japan, give me a call. You know, I want to do something with you guys. And um, when we, once we got back, I think we waited around in L.A., kind of hung around in L.A. for like a month. I hung around for a month. And then we started rehearsing at Center Stage. And uh, we rehearsed for a while. We did a lot of house parties. I mean, like a, a gang of house parties um, and a lot of rehearsing. Um, and then at that point, I think Frank decided he wanted to continue his career, his solo career. And so at that time, I think we kept working with Prince and Tamar because she was also singing too. And so we did a few shows with her. And at that, I guess that went on for a little while. And then she decided she wanted to go on and do her solo thing too, you know. Um, at that point, we told Prince, hey, we would love to continue to work with you if you want to have us. And, you know, maybe a couple of weeks later, we were in Paisley Park, you know, recording with them. So, and it just took off from there. Okay, so how old were you at this time when, when this all went, went down? Because you're 42 now, you uh, said. So what are you, 12? I was, huh? <laughs> were you 12 then? I mean, oh, no. Yeah. I was, um, how old was I then? I had to be like 24. Like Okay, so you walk into this rehearsal place, and of course your, your gal's there, so you're comfortable with that riff. But yeah. there's, now you've seen Purple Rain. You're obviously a fan of this guy's incredible music. What was going through your head when you first walked? I mean, there had to be a certain amount of nerves going on. Oh or yeah, I mean, I, yeah, oh yeah, I was very nervous because I, I, you know, it's like I, I, when I, I've seen him like on TV or on movies or you know, so I've never like to see him like in person. You know, that was like, like <laughs> incredible. Like I couldn't believe it. Like I'm sitting here in the same room with Prince. You know, um, I'm trying to remember the first time I actually. I guess the first time was at the house. Cause I guess we got the house now. I really couldn't believe I was there at the house, but then it, when we started the rehearsals, um, we were rehearsed a while before Prince would even show up, you know? And then it's like, I guess this one particular day he decided he wants to come to rehearsal. So you get somebody that comes in and say, okay, Prince is on the way to the rehearsal. He's 30 minutes out. So, you know, we still rehearsing and then they'll come back in and say, okay, he's 15 minutes away, you know? So now, you know, we get nervous cause the closer he, closer he gets there the nervous we get the more nervous we get and then uh and then somebody hit then he'd come back in so okay he's he just pulled up <laughs> you know and so then the you know frank will stop the band like let's take a little break and you know wait for him to come in you know so we just sitting in there talking and then the door opens and prince walks in he's like oh wow you know everybody stops talking you know like oh man prince is here <laughs> you know so <laughs> so is this the beginning of the new power generation is that were you guys like the first guys that were involved with that? 
But no, there was gener a new power generation uh, with, um, I believe with um, um, John Blackwell, Ronda Smith, um, you know, Maceo, Greg Boyer, Scott, uh, Mike Scott, all those guys, when they did the musicology tour, I believe that's okay. when he was doing the new power generation thing. Uh, we just kind of came in after them. You know? So were you guys both joining that group at that point? Yeah, what, Corey and I? Yeah. Yeah, 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 we were. Yeah, that's amazing. So now, now you guys are a member of the New Power Generation. You're touring and recording with him. Uh, how many actual albums did you record with him? Uh, I believe it was about five. I remember um, 2010 record, um, the Lotus Flower record, 3121, um, Planet Earth. And I think there might be another one. But that's four so far. That's amazing. And plus all the other unreleased stuff that we'll get to in a bit. Yeah, exactly. The unreleased, yeah. 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 Uh, I saw the 60 Minutes episode about the vault at uh, Paisley Park. And, you know, they, they sort of couldn't really go in there, but you had an idea that the thing is just chock-a-block with unreleased material. Mm -hmm. it's, it's like, I mean, I can't even imagine a guy that had that work ethic, you know, that, that <laughs> would just like rehearse, you know, 12 hours a day and then record and then, you know, go and tour and then, you know, go and jam. And it's like, he never stopped this guy. Yeah. He never, he never stopped. You know, it was just ongoing, you know, <laughs> I got yeah, a, I got a crazy. question from one of our viewers named uh, Dwayne Purdy. He says, uh, Prince has a reputation for being like really in control of his music. But when you were there and you were laying down, you know, bass parts and stuff, was he giving you your head? Like, was he letting you do what you wanted to do? Or did he have a finite idea in mind going, this is what I want you to play? How did that well, work? It, de it depended on the song, you know. Um, he would always give me what he wanted me to play. Um, but he was also open to me, you know, adding, you know, to, you know, if it felt right, you know, he was, he was very open to it. You know, he would tell me if it feels right. You know, and if, if the placement is right, you know, do it, go for it. He say, but when you go for it, go for it. Don't, don't like, don't be timid with it. You know, just, you know, play it like you meant to play it. You know, was there ever a time when he took over? Uh, I, I mean, well, I guess yeah, it depends. Yeah, yeah. like I, I remember one rehearsal. Um, he was giving me parts, giving the keyboard player parts, giving the drummer parts, and I guess it just. I, it, it was kind of funny because he would every time he would come back to me, he would change the bass line a little bit. And then it got it got to the point where he was like, why are you playing it like that? And I say, well, you showed me that. So I'm just playing what you showed me. <laughs> so then he was like, let me see the bass. Yeah, grab the bass. And he'll <laughs> yeah, because he, he was a virtuoso at everything, wasn't he? I mean, you know, I, yeah, I heard yeah. like when he played in Calgary the last time I saw him, uh, I can't remember what year, just a few years back. Uh, he went to a club that we used to frequent and play drums all night. Really? <laughs> you know, and then, you know, another time I heard he came into another place and played bass guitar all night, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the guy was just yeah. a monster guitar player. Well, everything, you know? Uh, exactly, man. I loved hearing him playing. playing I mean, I, I I loved him hearing him playing on everything, but, you know, guitar was like one of my favorite instruments to him play, you know? Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. you, you guys, you know, he, he was always known for having, like, really big bands, but it seems like he would configure things depending on, you know, what kind of music he was going to do. You did that, what was it, Planet Earth tour where you guys were in London? And yep. it was just you and Cora and him, right? Well, uh, yeah, uh, the, the, you're talking about one of the Indigo shows. The, it could have uh, been, yeah, but it was just a yeah. trio that went out. It was a trio. We did a trio one night, yeah. So what's he doing, Jimi Hendrix stuff? Yeah, he, he did some Jimi Hendrix. We, what else we do? I actually have a recording of that whole show. <laughs> I got to go back and look and see what song. I know we did. Um, what's the song? Girls and Boys. We did like a lot of his hits. It was just guitar, bass, and drums. We just had fun that night. And the audience, uh, I mean, they, of course, they're, they're going to eat it up because of the quality of the musicianship anyway, and there's Prince doing it. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, I, I mean, you know, he, he mentioned doing it, and I was like, okay, I'll go with it. Let's go. You know, let's do it. It's well, just going to be us on stage, but, you know. <laughs> well, you know, I come from a trio background, right? My band uh, Gatto was just a power trio. So yeah. I, I, I know that feeling of like how much room you got to move around in in that. 
I actually lost all my technique playing in a rock power trio because before that I was playing fingerstyle bass and, you know, a little bit of thumb bass and stuff. And then I got into a band where all I was doing was pumping eights all night, <laughs> you know, give the guitar player a lot of room. Oh, wow. But were you playing a lot of fluid bass lines during that time? Like, were yeah, you I moving mean, I around? Was, I was, uh, I mean, I, I guess I just stuck with the bass line, just, you know, just kind of stuck with the groove, you know. And just kind of follow him wherever he, you know, will lead us, you know. <laughs> and apparently he's a really good guy at leading musicians. Oh, so the guys yes. I was telling you about, and I'm going to tell the audience now because I haven't had a chance to uh, to discuss this yet. But one night I, I, I used to host a jam session in Toronto in this basement blues club. And one Tuesday night I called up this guy and I said, look, at, you know, I, I don't feel like coming in tonight, man. And uh, the next day he calls me up and says, geez, you're never going to believe this. But Prince showed up last night. And sat in all night with us. <laughs> I, went, I said, and you didn't phone me why? And he goes, well, yeah. you took the night off, you know. But they told me that all he did was he played the guitar with his left hand. And knowing me and my big mouth, I would have said, you know, this kid's pretty good. Can you imagine what he could do if he put both hands on the guitar? You yeah, know? exactly. So, but, uh, boy, that's something else, man. You got the, the chance to do that. The touring days, I mean... First of all, a guy like that, his feet don't even touch the ground. I mean, you know, he's a superstar. But yeah. now you're playing with a superstar. What were the traveling conditions like in the hotels and all the other great stuff that comes with playing with a superstar? I, uh, I mean, you know, uh, if we didn't stay at the same hotel he did, I mean, it was something that was, you know, very nice. Uh, um, I'm trying to remember. We moved around a lot so much. I know when we, when we were in Europe, um, but I mean, everything was, I mean, very, very uh, upscale, very nice. I mean, and it, it'll be funny because uh, if we stayed at a hotel that had a band, you know, and the Prince found out, you know, he knew he's going to show up and sit in and play, you know, <laughs> which would be, you know, kind of cool too, you know, so. <laughs> Man. So, okay. I got um, uh, a working day at Paisley Park. Uh, is it still a functioning studio today or is it more of a shrine and museum to it? to his uh, his legend I, I i think it is still a functioning studio i don't know um how often they use it to record i know i was there uh recording something when was that maybe a few years back uh because they were doing a tribute record uh with one of the singers marva king um we recorded there was it a few years back now yeah i think so uh but uh, I know it is a museum, but you still can record that. I think people can't request to record there. Um, but it's still functioning, though. Now, and you guys go out once in a while, and the New Power Generation does like a tribute, right? So you get a lot of the alumni together, and you do concerts yeah. or did concerts when we could. Uh, yeah, going out. yeah. What's that scene like? Like how many of the original guys are around? How many bass players are in the band, for starters? I saw a bit of a clip. There was five bass players on stage. Oh yeah, that was the that was the first one we did. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that was the first one we did. Uh, and then I know after that, uh, Kirk uh, Johnson, one of the drummers, he would kind of like you know exchange the members out. You know, each year he would pick another select group of musicians to play, and then the next following year he would do the same thing. Uh, just to try to give everybody a chance to be a part of the tribute. You know, give everybody a chance to come and come out and play and celebrate. You know, Prince. You, you mentioned earlier the uh, the recording of the 31, was it 3121 album? Yes. Mm -hmm. But they also, he decided to make a film of that, did he not? And I, I read in one of the sheets that I found that you and Cora played, but something happened. And the next thing you know, he brought in a couple of other people. Like, does he lay it on you as a surprise or you just see it when you see the finished thing and go, well, hang on, where am I? Like, did you know that that was going to happen? I did not know. We did not know. Uh, yeah. because that was our first day coming to Paisley. That was our first day in Minneapolis. Right. Uh, we came straight from the airport, straight to Paisley Park. When we get there, he was like, okay, let's record this song in the studio. I'm like, okay. So he's teaching us this song. <laughs> and there are cameras everywhere in, you know, in the studio. So I'm like, okay. And then he gave me a line. He said, he told me to say something. He's going to come in and say this, say some words, and then I'll say something and then he'll storm out and then I'll look at Cora and that was it for that scene, you know? <laughs> and then later when we like actually watched the, the film, what you explained, you know, I guess he, he wanted to make it look like we were the young crew coming in trying to play 
and we couldn't catch it, so we had to call some of the old cats to come in and get it. It was kind of funny, but we didn't know what the scene was until we actually saw it once it was done. <laughs> so, so how were you accepted by the older guys in general anyway, like the guys that have been, I know there's, and his name is escaping me right now. He was a keyboard player that was with him for like 20 years. Um, oh yeah, Morris Hayes. That guy, yeah. Morris yeah. Hayes. yeah oh, like, Morris, man, a really good guy, genuine guy, man. Killer player oh, yeah. too. Oh yeah. I mean, man, he, <laughs> yeah, he, uh, yeah. I mean, he was a, he was a, a, like one of the main pieces of, of the show, you know? You know so. so you got four guys at the Super Bowl. You've got the new power generation with the horn section and everything. What was the largest uh, configuration of musicians that you played when you were with your time with Prince? Like how many guys and, and dancers and everything, the biggest number of people that you had? The, Biggest number, I, I would, I guess I would say um, when we did the O2, uh, because yeah, we had the horn section, Maceo was there. Maceo Greg, Parker? Yeah, Maceo Parker, Lucky Mike you. Phillips, yeah, yeah, Lee Hogan, nice. Greg Barrier, yeah. Oh, the the James um, Brown guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That must yeah. have been heady stuff for a young guy, man, looking around you going, like not only is that Prince there, but you got Maceo and and you know Morris Hayes and all those guys playing on stage with you. Yeah, man, Renato Neto, you know all them cats, man. And you mentioned the O2. You guys did twenty one dates there. Yeah, twenty one oh, shows. O two is in London, nights. of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah was that it was every, awesome. Was it every night? No, it wasn't every night. Um, I think it was. Let me see. It may have been. Yeah, it wasn't every night. It was broken up, you know, maybe one or two shows one week and then the next week, maybe off and, you know, and so, so on. But for a total of 21 days. 21 nights, yes. So if I'm not mistaken, that's the same thing that Michael Jackson was scheduled to do when he yeah. uh, he, he, he passed away. Yeah, so yeah. The same, yeah. same sort of deal, because I remember they made that uh, that movie of him rehearsing the band. And then and I'm glad they did that, because at least we got to see what it would have been like. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But when you think they sort of made it sound like it was like a residency gig and you're playing 21 days in a row in a 20,000 or 30,000 seat arena, like a club gig. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. but it's nice to hear that they broke it up. I mean, especially for Prince, because he's got to sing and dance and do all that stuff every night, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Tireless worker, man. Incredible. Yeah. You guys would rehearse from noon to midnight at Paisley Park. And then his guys would come in, his, you know, his assistants and light candles because they're on the phone getting A-list celebrities to come over for the jam session after you've worked for 12 hours. Right. And then uh, what I really loved was they would pick up random people, I guess, and just bring them in and exactly. I guess, blow their minds, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember those days. Uh rehearsing all day you know and sometimes he would he would normally have dinner there at the studio but when he didn't we would go out and grab something to eat so when we would leave the studio for dinner we would be, we would be gone for like two or three hours because we know when we get back we're gonna be working you know uh <laughs> then when we come back we run the show again you know then like it's like you said you know around 12 maybe one he you say y'all want to have a party you know we're not gonna say no we're like okay <laughs> so then uh He'll call some people over, you know, we'll sit around and kind of, you know, wait a little bit. People show up, you know, we'll jump on stage and run the whole show again. And he'll just start calling different tunes, you know. So who were some so, of the A-list people? I read that Eddie Murphy would show up there. And uh, who were some of the, yeah. like, so this is at, in Minneapolis now, right? Well, yeah, I, it, it happened in Minneapolis and also in California, too. Okay, that makes sense. Of, yeah. parties in California. That's how those movie stars would show up there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And what were you thinking <laughs> about that? I mean, you know, of course, now you're marginally jaded because you've been playing with Prince, you know. <laughs> yeah. But it's still got to sort of do your head in when you look over there and there's Eddie Murphy sitting there watching you play. Exactly. Eddie Murphy, Chris Rock, you know, Stevie Wonder, like Shaka Khan. It's like, like what? You know. <laughs> and you got to meet and hang out with all these cats. Yeah, I got to meet them, yeah. Did this, <laughs> Did Stevie sit in with you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He sat in. I remember sat in at one of the parties in California in, in LA. He said, get on stage and play it a little bit, song and everything. You know? Jesus, man. Yeah. And I'm going to pitch. I can't believe the luck you had. That's incredible. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, That's amazing. Yeah. So what have I got next? I want, I, want to, uh, I want to throw this one around. This is complete reversal here. A few years ago, you, you were in Toronto for the Toronto International Film Festival, and you were kind enough to call me up because you were with your pal Dave Chappelle, mm -hmm. who was starring in the premiere of a new movie called The Star is Born, the remake, with Lady Gaga and Bradley Cooper. And you called me up and kindly invited me to the premiere. And where I, I was three hours outside of Toronto finishing my second book. And mm. I'm still kicking myself for this one. But how did that <laughs> evening go down? Oh, man, it was it was great. You know, uh, they, once they did the premiere show at the movie, Dave does this thing called the Juke Joint. And what it is, he have a live band there, like a full band. And he have a DJ there. And he would he would invite different artists to come and just jump on stage and just kind of vibe it out. You know, we'll play different songs and we'll just kind of, you know, kind of hear some of his favorite artists sing and perform, you know. Uh, so that that was that was a that was a great uh event. It came out great, turned out great. How did you hook up with Dave Chappelle? Because you you did a lot of work with him, right? I did uh most of those juke joints, uh not when they first started, but the, after the first one, I think I, I did the majority of them. Um a friend of mine, Fred Yane, uh, harmonica player. He worked with Prince as well, and his wife is the publicist for Dave, Dave Chappelle. So um, once Dave Chappelle started doing, you know, those shows, those juke joints, you know, Fred would, you know, tell his wife, "Hey, call Josh and Cora, they come over and play." So he would. He had the horn section from Stevie Wonder's band. Um, Cora, Cora and I would play, and he would just kind of pick different musicians from different bands and put it together. Very nice. You know, I've been staring at this thing behind you. Can you show the folks that bass that you got sitting there? Because oh this yeah, is, this is one of your ones that you get made and you get them for free. You bugger you! <laughs> <laughs> wow, tell us about that guy. So yeah, this this the uh, the luthier is a uh, Jens Ritter. He's in Germany, and um, I actually got this. Actually, he made this bass for Prince. Um, he he emailed me one day. And he wanted to sit with me. He was telling me he was going to be at NAMM one year and he wanted me to come by his booth. So um, that year I went by, I sat and talked with him. He asked me some questions about Prince, what he liked, what he doesn't like, you know, that's like that sort of thing. And I, at that time I was with another company, a bass company, so I couldn't get one of the bases. Um, so he took his notes and he said he was going to make Prince a bass and he wanted me to give it to him. I say, fine, that's cool. Um, <laughs> like maybe eight months later, he calls me and he says, um, the bass is almost ready. You know, I'm like, cool, cool, okay, okay. And he asked me how was how were things with the company I was with. So I told him, I said, well, things didn't really work out. You know, I'm not with them anymore. I'm just kind of playing whatever. So he said, well, why you didn't why you didn't tell me? You know, I would have made you something, you know. So I was like, well, you know, it's no big deal, you know. So he he told me, he said, Well, since you you're not with a company, you don't have a base, I'm gonna give you this base, I make the prints. And if he wants one, I'll make prints one. So I'm like, oh, wow, you know, so he brings the bass to Houston, you know, <laughs> brings me the bass, uh, get the bass. Wait, and then I, I think maybe a few weeks, maybe a month later, we had to go out to California with, to see Prince to, you know, I guess we were getting ready to do a show. Uh, we get to California, we get to the house, we get downstairs to the basement, Prince walks up and say, I got a new guitar. I was like, oh, nice. So he pulls out this Fender purple, dark purple Fender, really nice guitar. And I still had my bass in the bag, so he he didn't know what I had. I never told him what I had. So I go to my bass bag, I pull the bass out, and I show him the bass, and he just paused and look at it, like just staring. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, you don't want that bass. You gotta give it to me, you don't want it. But I was like, I, I, and I was like, man, I, I mean, I love it. So I plugged it up and played it. And I said, like, you want to play it? He was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to play it. I'm going to play it. So, uh, but it's funny, though. I never told him that it was for him. <laughs> I was going to just ask you that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because it actually sort of looks, it's not the same guy that built him the guitar that looks like that, is it? Uh, the rhythm guitars? Well, you know, the, 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 the ones with like the, you know, it's got the big horn on it and stuff. Not the one he used in uh, uh, in Purple Rain at the at the show, but. Because I no. saw him in Toronto and he had a white guitar that looked like that with the big horn on the top of it. No, it's not the same guy. No. Okay, because it looks yeah. very similar. But all okay. of, please tell me that all that gold on there is not real. Is that, is that, is that real? Well, it's, it's gold leaf. Gold leaf. Yeah, gold leaf. 
But you know the it, the knobs. I, I think that gold plated the knobs have diamonds in them. I don't know if you can see the diamonds in the knobs. So unbelievable. Uh, yeah, it's crazy. Is, is, is that it sounds all, amazing? Is that all inlay in the neck? Oh or yeah, yes, yeah, the gold leaf. Unbelievable, man. That's yeah. beautiful. What would something like that retail for? Do you think? I I think it's about fifteen thousand for this space. D does it come in blue? <laughs> uh, any color you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay the other thing i've been staring at there man is that is that some sort of an award right behind you that picture of prince with the purple guitar there oh yeah yeah that's when we did 21 nights in london oh uh, it's from they that gave everybody yeah they gave it they gave this to everybody that did the uh 21, 21 nights in london so uh one of the things i kind of one of the souvenirs i have from doing that show yeah how much stuff did you keep from that era like did you the stage suits and stuff like that did you get to keep everything no, actually, I don't have any suits. I think I had a few, uh, few timber rings. I have some uh, picture books uh, with the CD, live CD in there. Um, yeah, and I, but but I think I, we did have a lot of stuff. I, I know we had most of that stuff in the storage a few a few years back, and the storage caught on fire. So some of that stuff we lost too. But I I do have some things I was able to keep, you know, and hold on to. So amplifiers and stuff were you getting stuff from all the companies i mean once you oh, yeah, once yeah. you join a band like that people are just dying to let you use their stuff exactly <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 i had uh amplifiers with uh Galen kruger um i played a lot of that gear uh actually love that gear uh who else a string company i think at the time i was with dean markley strings right now i'm using dr strings i love them uh Bases, you know, the Ritter bass. I actually have a signature bass with Ritter. Uh, it's called the Core Bass. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah, so I have a signature bass. Yeah. Doesn't it kill you though? It always killed me. And I, I'll tell you this other story about Leland Sklar in a second. This other great bass player from the day. It, you get to a certain point of you know fame or whatever it is, or you're working with the right guy, and people are giving. Now you're making real money. You can afford to buy a fifteen thousand dollar bass, and people are giving them to you yeah <laughs> and free strings and all yeah. that stuff that when we were struggling you know you're going geez i wish i had enough money for a set of strings and these guys are giving you boxes full of them you know? boxes of strings yeah no do you do you know who leland sklar is he's he's the bass player with the long beard he looks like he's in zz top he's got gray hair he's he's played with james taylor and uh, he's an la guy he's recorded with everybody I think I've seen him before. You've seen him for sure. He, yeah. I met him when uh, my, my buddy Steve Lukather is, uh, plays with Toto, and Lee was playing with him, and mm -hmm. uh, Steve invited me up to their gig, and I got talking to him because he's always been, you know, one of my favorites, so okay, let's chat, you know, and he yeah. says, uh, do people give you stuff? I said, yeah, occasionally I get, you know, the odd bass or guitar thrown at me, you know, and strings and stuff. <laughs> he says, uh, did you ever sell any of the ones you got? And I said, once he says i had a company once give me 10 bases and he says they weren't that good so i sold them all and a week, <laughs> a week later they called me up and said we're sending a photographer over we want to get a picture of you with all those bases wow <laughs> he's already got rid of them right yeah <laughs> you didn't have anything like that happen i hope no i mean i i got a few bases um uh, but i returned them though you know I didn't keep them. I didn't. Yeah, I, I had a few bases. I played them, and I just, I just told them, "Hey, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling it." And I just return them, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, the the next time that happens, return one to me, okay? <laughs> oh, okay, okay. <laughs> there, there was a there was a musician that played uh, sax player Adrian Crutchfield. Yeah. Okay, so he was in the band when you were there. No, Adrian was. Uh, they came after after we had. Well, yeah. Okay, well, this is leading up to something, uh, unlike most of the other things I've asked you tonight. Uh, he told a story about the first time that he went in to meet with Prince. Prince came in and he said he was just, you know, like, like beside himself with nerves that he was going to, you know, actually play in front of this guy. Mm -hmm. And uh, Prince says, is there anything that you need? And he, he managed to blurt out the word water. And he says, <laughs> instead of a, an assistant going to get it, Prince went to the fridge and got him a bottle of water and brought it back to him. Yeah. And he says he's, he sort of couldn't wrap his head around the fact that this guy didn't have, you know, the water miraculously appear, <laughs> but he seemed to be known for those like little real acts of human kindness. Did you experience that when you were working with him? Yeah. Yeah. I experienced that. Yeah. He's uh, 
very yeah very genuine guy i mean i mean he'd be hang, he, he would even hang out with us and just talk just about you know music just about stuff that not even music related just about life you know uh you know uh sometimes go out with go out to dinner with us you know meet us at a restaurant you know and just kind of sit and chat with us so but yeah he would do those things would he get into politics and theology or was he keeping that stuff pretty close to the chest i mean he, he, looks he, like, he, looked like a, he looked like a religious guy like he had uh, faith you know yeah 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 yeah. He, i mean he would speak on it uh you know he speak about it a little bit um yeah, and you're right. I mean, you know, he, he uh, you know, he, he, I mean, everybody knows he was a Jehovah Witness, so you know, uh, really heavy in, into that, you know. So you see, I did not know that. So oh, he you didn't? Was, no. Did he ever do what Michael Jackson did and go out to the houses like they're supposed to do? And you know, like, you know, here I am standing on your front door, and you know, have you heard the the word of Jehovah and stuff? Did he do that sort of stuff? I, I know he would go to like. I guess they would. Have, I don't. I don't know how it's how it's normally set up, but I know he would go to the service and he would always invite me, uh, invite us to go, you know, whoever wanted to go with him. Yeah. You know? But of course yeah. you're Baptist and it's a whole different riff going on there. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, and not that I couldn't go, but you know, I mean, uh, I guess at that time I just wasn't interested, but I would, you know, tell him thanks, but you know, no thanks, I won't make it, you know, and, and he, he was, didn't really have a, he didn't have a problem with that, you know. Now that's cool. <laughs> yeah, he wasn't foisting his beliefs on anybody else. If he wanted to join in, join in. Right. Very cool. Great respect. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay, now we're going to get into the big one. We're going to talk about mm. Super Bowl 41. 